Now on BBC Four, discussing his four years as the chairman of the board for British Railways, Eric Robson asks Lord Beeching if he'd have done anything differently with the benefit of hindsight. plan for the future of our railways was published 18 years ago. As a result, the railway system we fondly imagined to be the best in the world was cut in half by the most drastic reorganisation plan in its history. For thousands of rail travellers and people who live in out-of-the-way places, Beeching the Axeman became the villain of the piece. But with hindsight, does Lord Beeching still think he was right? Would he do the same again? I'll be asking him in a few minutes. But first, a reminder of how the Beeching plan was received in its day. At the end of the 50s, British railways were in a mess. A decade before they'd been nationalized out of bankruptcy, they briefly paid their way, and then began the seemingly inevitable slide towards losses of 100 million pounds a year or more. Engines and rolling stock were hopelessly out of date. On a network that hadn't changed much since the days of Victorian railway mania, thousands of miles of branch line lost money on every rare passenger they carried. Profits should have been restored by freight, but that was already being seduced onto roads that had a price advantage and, more important, the blessing of government. Ernest Marples, the transport minister, was opening a new era of British transport. Railways like canals were out of debt. This was the age of the road. Now, sir, this motorway starts a new era in road travel. It is in keeping with the bold, exciting and scientific age in which we live. It is a powerful weapon to add to our transport system. But something had to be done with the railways, and the man Marples picked to do it was a director of ICI, Dr Richard Beeching. His appointment wasn't popular with railwomen or the opposition Labour Party, not least because he insisted on keeping the same salary he had at ICI, £24,000 a year, compared with the £10,000 a year paid to his predecessor at British Rail. We soon saw what we were getting for our money, an uncompromising new structure for the railways and a boss who refused to pull his punches. A year ago, only a super Micawba could have been optimistic about the possibility of making a widespread national railway system pay again. There was no evidence to support such optimism. No changes were envisaged that could be expected to bring solvency. And even a few months ago, although our hopes were growing, we still had to be cautious. We didn't know how much railway could be made to pay. Now, however, we see prospects of operating a system which will carry a greater amount of traffic than the total at present carried, and which will flourish financially while doing so. There'd been speculation for months about how he'd achieve such profitability. When the details were finally released, it still came as a shock. There's never been a doomsday book of British Railways like this. And if the government approves, today's report will shape the future of the system. More than 2,000 stations will be closed. Some are tiny wayside halts, some at famous seaside resorts, some in big cities like Edinburgh, Glasgow and Liverpool. Wholesale shutdown of passenger services will leave huge areas of the country to the buses. The annual loss of 140 millions a year will not be wiped out. But by 1970, most of it should be gone. Every part of the country is affected, but the most dramatic effects are in Scotland. Remote areas of the Highlands will lose their passenger services. North of Aberdeen, very few will be left. 
and south of Edinburgh too, many local passenger services will go. In Wales too, they're drastically reduced. Many of the country services are doomed, leaving only three main links east and west. And a shock for the north, the Holiday Coast will have no more stopping trains. Holiday resorts in the west country share the fate of many market towns, no station, no passenger trains. And North Devon and North Cornwall resorts are especially hit. In the northeast, little more than the main north-south links will remain. All this if the plan goes through. Britain is going to be a different place. A new look for a much reduced system could mean eventually 70,000 fewer jobs. Some of the cash compensation has already been agreed with the unions. But make no mistake about this. This is going to be a big upheaval for Britain, but particularly for the men of British Railways. The uneconomic passengers of British Rail faced upheaval too. From now on, many thousands of them would be buying a car or on the buses. Much of the serious press of the day applauded the beaching plan as the only way of cutting the railway losses. Even the cartoonists of Punch saw the good doctor as Prime Minister Macmillan's most skillful bicycle repairman. But he wasn't going to escape quite so easily as that. Continental look. We're out of the common market now, and someone should let Beeching know just for the book. Oh, Mr. Porter, what shall I do? They've taken away your station, though your uniform is new. I'll have to get to London the best way I can see. Whoa, oh, Mr. Porter, what a tired chap. I'll be. Both the Daily Mail on Monday and the Daily Herald on Wednesday carried advanced news of Dr. Beeching's latest threat to axe the branch lines. Rural travellers and train spotters are up in arms again. People in fields at Chipping Norton. How will they know the time of day should the 12.30 cease to run eight minutes late down Didcot Way? And oh, the anguish at the deep heart's core. The milk train does not stop here anymore. Good doctor, have you never dawdled where the down train should have been, breathed in the unforgettable, unforgotten station smell, part dust, part kerosene? Let your degree, your PhD, earned in the field of electronics, prove to the world man's proper study is viable railway economics. Richard Beeching wasn't a man to take such jibes lying down. He ordered and starred in his own film, which taught us the official Beeching version. Now, some of you will say that with a public service, profitability isn't the only yardstick, that it isn't the only measure of value or even of efficiency. And of course it isn't. So I don't want to argue about that. But the real issue is different. The real question is whether you, as owners of the railways, want us to go on running these services at very high cost when the demand for them has very largely disappeared. Such cool logic cut little ice with people whose trains didn't run anymore. There were dozens of protest campaigns. People who suddenly realised what they were going to lose were up in arms in places like the central borders of Scotland. It was an absolute bombshell for the whole area. And when you consider the likes of Hike, these places was about 16,000 population, and no train service, it's absolutely ridiculous. But at that time, it just seemed to be the point that if it didn't pay, it was cut out. Nobody took time to sit down and say, well, can we make it pay? The cash seemed to be more important than human beings. The protests were noted, but the restructuring went ahead as planned. The trains stopped, and Dr. Beeching stuck to his guns. Do you think 
they should be made to pay like any commercial concern? Yes, I do. I think that if it's at all possible, they should be made to pay. I think it's important from everybody's point of view. Isn't there something to be said for the railways being run as a service to the nation rather than on the strict profit and loss basis of a private company? There is something to be said, but I think it's a doubtful argument. Somebody's got to pay, and if a service of this kind uh, is not supported by those who use it, then it means uh, a tax on the populace in general. But isn't the whole point of nationalisation that you don't have to have an ordinary private enterprise sound way of conducting a business? Oh, oh, yes, it is. But I think that to carry that to the point where you fossilise some particular form of activity would be absurd. Yes, you're not necessarily fossilising a particular form of activity if you keep a service running even though it's not technically economic in profit and loss terms, though, are you? No, but you might still have stagecoaches if you did that. Richard Beecham hauled the railways through many of their problems. He didn't get all his own way. Electrification went ahead on the main lines, despite his opposition. His greatest achievement was undoubtedly his new structure for rail freight. The old private sidings and individually shunted wagons were replaced by long-distance container and single-product trains. There was to be a fast, modern, intercity passenger network. But British Rail never achieved the profitability he prophesied in those early days. The crisis of railway finance is with us still, as is the phrase, doing a beaching. From what's happened this week to what's going to happen this summer. May, government announces new beaching plan for Britain. Armed Forces, Royal Family and State Schools all found uneconomic. Axed, replaced by rural bus services. Lord Beeching, does it surprise you, after all the hard work you did in your time running British Railways, that in the public consciousness you're still remembered as the man who axed a lot of branch lines? Uh, it doesn't surprise me, no. I think it's um, a little um, unfortunate, um, from my point of view, unjust, but uh, it doesn't surprise me. It's a nice, simple idea to fix in one's head. And after all, um, most people aren't remembered at all. Um, you can't really complain if you're remembered on an oversimplified basis, can you? But with hindsight, do you wish you hadn't closed those branch lines? Oh, no, not for one moment. Um, I'm only sorry uh, that um, the planning that we did during my period as chairman of the Railways Board uh, wasn't carried uh, further to completion. So there are lines in existence today that you feel should have gone years ago? Yes, um, about uh, half or something like half of the so-called trunk route system of the country should disappear. It would still leave us with more railway trunk route than there are trunk roads in the way of motorways in the country. But could you give me an example of a line that's in use today that you feel should have closed? Well, it would be dangerous for me to start talking now because, uh, quite frankly, I'm out of touch with the loadings on the various lines. But uh, there were two lines to Birmingham, one of which could certainly close. Uh, there's an East Coast route to Scotland and there's a West Coast route. The West Coast route carries nearly all the traffic. The East Coast route beyond... Um, Newcastle could be closed without any hardship to anybody except people in Berwick-on-Tweed. Can I take you back to that um, time when you were plucked out of industry by Ernest Marples and given the job of running the railways, doing something with the railways? What were the terms of reference you were given when you went to the British Railways Board? Well, of course, a lot of people ask this question, and while I was in office, a lot of MPs used to say, well, of course, we think you're a good chap and you're doing a very good job, but your terms of reference are wrong. Well, I didn't have any terms of reference in that sense other than the Acts of Parliament by which the railway, uh, the nationalised railway organisation had been set up and uh, by which it had been, the responsibilities had been modified subsequently. The Acts were the terms of reference. There, were, there weren't any special instructions. I never received any. I didn't expect to receive any and I wouldn't have thought that it was proper that I should have had any. But I, uh, what those MPs are probably getting at is that you did appear to be looking at the railways in isolation, well, not looking at it as part of a, an integrated transport policy. Quite like. so. Well, this was said too very often 
but of course it was totally untrue. You, you can't uh, examine a business, you can't see what traffic is likely to be available to the railways, what the advantages of the railways are relative to other forms of uh, conveyance. Uh, you can't do the job without considering all the alternative forms of transport. So the planning was done with a very lively interest and a, a considerable research into the capacity of, the merits of, and the loading of the alternatives. But at the same time, you, you did seem to accept what many people would argue is a bad system, and that is the hidden subsidies for road transport, Although, which actually leaves, leaves railways in a pretty bad position from the word go. Um, we didn't ignore it. In fact, we published a report drawing attention to the fact that the trunk hauliers on the motorways were not paying their fair whack of the cost of providing those motorways. Um, we weren't ignoring it. We, we publicised it. Uh, and, of course, it was for the Ministry to take action on the basis of these uh, reports uh, when considering the balance between road and rail. Uh, we certainly didn't ignore it. But given that you, that you went for, a, in rail freight terms, you went for a preferred system, which was through trains, complete trains of freight, uh, doing away with you know, individual wagon loads, you did seem to be uh, giving up the fight in quite a big part of the, of, of the battle no. and just giving the rest away to the roads. No, no, that wasn't giving up the fight. That was recognising the natural strengths and weaknesses of the railways and exploiting the strengths and withdrawing from those parts of the overall operation uh, of the overall freight movement in the country, uh, which was not suited to rail. Uh, just to give you an example that brings this home very sharply, when I went to the railways, it was an established practice for road hauliers to take traffic down to Plymouth and then put it on rail for distribution in Cornwall. So they were doing the trunk haul that the railways were suited to and then giving the railway the job of distributing uh, on a fine scale over a large rural area. Um, giving the railway all the dirty work to do and taking the natural railway part of the operation to themselves. Now, I, my proposals were to emphasise and attract as far as possible the trunk movement of freight in the country and to uh, leave the distribution as one must do uh, to road hauliers for the fine scale collection and delivery of these bulk flows. People concerned with road haulage today, I think, are, are accepted to be a fairly powerful lobby. Was that a noticeable lobby in your time? Was it putting pressure on you? Uh, it didn't put pressure on me. It was a powerful lobby in my time, always has been. Uh, but the pressure wasn't put on me, it was put on members of parliament. Um, Were they putting pressure on you? Uh, sometimes, but not very much. No, I wasn't uh, strongly conscious of... Uh, pressures from the road hauliers. I was quite aware of their point of view, of course, and I had quite amiable relations with them generally while agreeing to differ from uh, with them over quite a few matters. Did you have political support? I mean, did you, did you find that the, the Cabinet generally backed you during your time? Uh, by and large, yes. Uh, I had support from the Prime Minister, who was responsible for appointing me, uh, I had support, of course, from Ernest Marples, who uh, was uh, behind the Prime Minister's appointment of me. Um, I had general support from the Cabinet as a result of Cabinet decision to accept the planning that we'd done. Uh, of course, that didn't stop uh, MPs from reverting to... Uh, a rather more troublesome view if some issue arose in their own constituency. Even ministers could be troublesome if they ran into uh, uh, an unpopular action in their own constituency. So, so did they try to lean on you? Uh, from time to time, and I leaned back. <laughs> <laughs> but looking at some of the effects, sticking with freight for a minute, uh, of, of so much freight being on the roads now. I'm sure anyone who sat in a traffic jam on the M1 behind all those heavy lorries must ask uh, if it doesn't stem from 
some of the things you did, that all that stuff is on the motorways. I mean, couldn't some of it be on the railways if it hadn't been for Dr. Beeching? Oh, no, none of it uh, is on the road because of me, because um, I didn't uh, diminish in any way the capacity of the railways to trunk haul freight. Could I turn to a, a couple of things that have happened since your time? Now, railways are very economic on energy compared with road transport. Would it have made a difference to you in, in the sort of freight you'd have carried, the, the number of lines you'd have left open, had you been able to foresee that we were going to go to an energy crisis in, in 1974? Well, it would certainly have made some difference, but uh, not a dramatic difference, I think. Uh, you say that the railways are very cheap in energy compared with road transport. Well, let's say they are more economical, but... Um, uh, when you can take energy into account with other factors, uh, the only common measure is cost. And we would have had to treat it in that way uh, if we were doing the sums now. And it would have had uh, some effect in swinging the balance in favour of railways, but not a great effect. It would have cut down the break-even distance at which, beyond which railways are cheaper for trunk haulage than road from, say, 120 miles to 100. Uh, but it wouldn't have... Uh, you see, there aren't many distances in this country where freight is hauled for much more than 100 miles. So that it wouldn't have uh, transformed the whole equation. The other effect which stays, pe stays with people of many of the things you did um, is the, the social need of railways. I mean, many people in places like the central borders um, would feel today that they are still deprived because they lost their railway line as a result of the beaching cuts. Um, do you not feel that railways should be treated more as a social service than you treated them in your day? Uh, not more as a social service than they were treated in my day. Uh, you see, you're talking about rural lines where the total traffic on them was very small, where a comparable level of service could be provided by buses for about a tenth of the cost. And you must realise that even the buses now in those areas are in trouble, costing as they do a tenth as much. They're still and in trouble. And being closed, yeah. And being closed. So that it's difficult under those circumstances to suppose that we close the railways prematurely. Uh, there isn't a great sense of hardship in the country. The, uh, it would be silly to pretend that nobody anywhere suffered hardship, but there was very little hardship as a result of these railway closures, and there's never been any evidence of a widespread uh, degree of hardship as a result. So it's, it's a sort of sentimentality, you say, which makes people hanker after their old railway? Well, of course they weren't using them when they were there. Do you think, though, that much of the work that you did, uh, many of the savings you made, have these things been frittered away since your time? Well, that would be unkind, wouldn't it? Um, let's say that some of the excellent planning that we did in my day has not been pursued to a conclusion with the vigour that I would have liked. Would we have been nearer to the age of the train if it had? Um, we'd have been nearer to the age uh, when we had a railway properly matched to the traffic pattern of the country. You see, when we put forward these proposals for the rationalisation of the trunk routes, we did this market survey and we looked into the future for 10 and 20 years and we forecast what the traffic patterns in the country were likely to be uh, in 74 and 84, and which part of that pattern was of such a nature that it would be favourable for the railways. And as far as I know, uh, well, I do know that the 74 figures were very close to the truth, and as far as one can foresee, the 84 figures are very close to the truth. Certainly, as far as the overall pattern is concerned, they're on the favourable side because we've had quite a degree of recession that wasn't allowed for in our forward look. And when uh, also they're uh, pretty good in the assessment of the proportion of the total traffic that's suitable for rail. And we have still several times the capacity in British Railways uh, that is necessary to deal with the flows of traffic that are likely to be with us in the future. So is this the age of the trend? Uh, well, I don't wish to say it isn't because um, my <laughs> successor is saying that it is. But uh, judge for yourself. <laughs>
Well, what do you think about some of the developments that they're uh, planning? Uh, with British Railways, advanced passenger trains, for example? Well, I think technically the advanced passenger train is a great achievement. And of course, if you're going to replace obsolete stock and all the while you continue to operate the route system that we've got, you must do that. Uh, I think this is uh, an, an excellent uh, form of train to substitute for the old stock. But um, I see very little likelihood that it will make a great difference to the commercial success of the railways uh, because so long as you're fast enough, uh, you uh, compete effectively with the air and, tra and road alternative and being half as fast again won't necessarily give you a corresponding increase in revenue because you pay a high price for speed, of course. So you wouldn't have put the money up for that sort of project? Well, I might or I might not in the case of specific routes. I can't tell. It's only if you are fully familiar with the current situation that you can make judgments of that sort. What about electrification? Uh, well, electrification uh, is a very questionable uh, change uh, of the railway system. Uh, once you've electrified, uh, of course, um, you can operate the system more cheaply, but uh, the capital cost of changing is high. Uh, proper return on the capital invested is a severe cost element in the balance. And the dislocation caused during several years of electrification can be very damaging. It was a great ha handicap to us. Did you enjoy your years at British Railways? Well, yes, I did. Um, I wouldn't have missed it for worlds. I, I didn't want to do it. Um, it. It wasn't a job that uh, any sensible man could uh, have rushed at, but uh, I did enjoy it, yes. Was it boring going back to industry again afterwards? Uh, it was pretty flat, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it was. So uh, now, do you ever sit there hoping the phone will ring? I mean, for example, would you have liked the government to have come to you and said, look, British Steel's in an awful mess. Will you come back and sort it out? Well, um, I would have been interested. Um, I don't know what my answer would have been. I feel I'm on the old side. It's a, a physical strain and a mental strain. And um, I don't know what my reaction would have been, uh, but I do feel I'm a bit on the old side. Was the strain made worse at the time by the, uh, the press opposition? Well, um, the press opposition, it, well, it wasn't just straight press opposition. I had a very troublesome period when I started because uh, the press seemed to be anxious to prove that it was an impertinence, uh, impertinence on my part to presume to run uh, the railways of the country. What does this man know about the railways and so on? Um, they were digging up any uh, little tidbits they could uh, find to um, diminish my qualification to do the job. Uh, but that, when that was over, and of course there was a great deal of fuss about my salary, which was merely a continuation of my ICI salary, um, but that got me uh, into the public eye in a way that served me in good stead thereafter. I was almost instantaneously transfer, transformed into somebody the public knew about, so that when I wanted to say something, I had a pretty good platform from which to say it. We began by talking about the fact that you are remembered for certain things, mainly for being a mad axeman, I suspect. Um, <laughs> well, of course, uh, I don't like being remembered as a mad axeman. I just wasn't mad like that. Uh, it was not a case of swinging an axe and chopping off anything that got in the way. It was a very um, carefully considered surgical operation, uh, the reshaping plan operation of cutting out the branch lines. Equally thoughtful were the proposals for rationalising the trunk routes. So I certainly don't like being thought of as a wild axe man. So you believe that people picked up the wrong end of the stick when they chose to look on doing a beaching in that way? I don't, don't know that people have, you see. I don't know to what extent people use the term with understanding. Some certainly do understand it. Uh, I had a lot of correspondence at the time and have had correspondence since, which show that a lot of people know what it was all about. 
but I don't know how many of them do. <laughs> Picking our way through some of the UK's fascinating network of disused railway lines next on BBC Four with Julia Bradbury's Railway Walks. I used to be the Man Express. Forty years ago, a controversial report wiped out a third of our railway network. Shocking. Ian Hislop goes off the rails to find out why. Anymore. Tonight at 9 on BBC4.